evening. I am Christopher Balzano. And I'm Ella Balzano. And you are listening to Tripping on Legends, episode 75. Sorry for our friends in um, uh, Midnight.fm. We had some technical difficulties. We have an amazing guest coming on tonight, and I normally don't do guests. So I try to do a different kind of... um, a different kind of uh, streaming service. You can't do it because then it will be yeah. like that. It'll end up like that. Sorry. There you go. So we are dealing with like 23 different things. For my Midnight.fm listeners, this is the first time that you are hearing, unless you've gone back and listened to some of our podcasts, Tripping on Legends, wherever podcasts are, available. Uh, are available, iTunes, um, Google Play, uh, uh, every place but, uh, we had Stitcher, every place but Spotify. We have, um, Ella's a regular contributor to Tripping on Legends. Maybe if you just get closer to me, it'll be better. Um, And so she's here tonight because, well, for two reasons. One, because um, we are talking about a legend that she actually has some familiarity with. Um, And the second aspect of this is that um, she she really wanted to talk about this specific legend and talk a little bit about um, some of the things that this is connected to. Because you've been to several locations that this legend um, is focused on, right? Uh, you've been to Bloody Bucket, mm-hmm. right? You've been to some other ones where this this case kind of uh, cuts in. We're having a really hard time with our IG feeds. Let's put it there. Oh, there you go. That's perfect. Right there you there. go. You got it. You got it, you girl. You got it. Um, so, and people don't want to see me anyway, so they just, we'll say camera two is the Ella camera and camera one is the Chris camera. Um, we have a guest coming in. Um, we have a a very special legend to talk about tonight and I never have guests, right? Mm -hmm. But I heard this guy's story, um, and I wanted to document, um, and I wanted him to tell us about it because the more I was looking into some of the legends that we were talking about and some legends that we've been tripping. I know, except for I I wanted to put it there because it's better. Um, I realized that there is a famous legend that a lot of these stories have to deal with, right? There are a lot of of the things we've talked about that have a particular um, backstory, right? And you wonder where that backstory comes from. This stuff is just in the ethers out there, mm-hmm. right? And you say, and I've always talked about um, how we connect to a story because we, um, we've heard it before, right? And so I really feel that this, um, that this backstory, that this legend that he's talking about, which is much more famous in, why don't you come over here a little bit? Um, much more uh, famous than we think it is. And I think it infiltrates legends and aspects of it because as I was talking about it tonight with some people, I realized that I actually encountered this legend and aspects of this legend in other um, legends that I did from Massachusetts. So he's going to call and he's going to talk about it. Before he calls, he's going to call in about five minutes, um, maybe even sooner. (laughs) Um, Can you... Tell me what you know from your um, tween perspective, because it's really popular with the kids these days, as really they say. Really popular with the kids. Um, can you talk about La Lorena and she's what you know me. about? First of all, I'm mispronouncing it. She's going to take the. First of all, she's literally taking the mic away from me. I oh love God, this. Go ahead. First of all, it's La Lorona. La Lorona. Okay, good. And second of all, um, basically, it's this lady who drowned her kids, is mm-hmm. what I remember. Okay. Um, and basically, she... It, yeah, she drowned her kids, and so, like, she takes your kids away mm-hmm. when they're being bad or something. Like, when if your one of your kids sees La Llorona, um, she she can get your children and whatnot. Okay, but, and where, where do you know this legend from? Like, where have you heard this legend? (laughs) I like how you're leaning in. The internet. The internet. I I feel like you think that you're answering a question on a game show or something like that. (laughs) Um, So, give me an example of you finding it on the internet. The movie. Okay, so there's a movie as well. There's there's a whole movie about it. Have you seen that movie? 
No, but I want to. And it's part of, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if you know, but it's part of like the whole Conjuring universe. So it's in the same universe as um, Isabel, not Isabel, uh, Annabelle, Annabelle, and Isabel. The Conjuring and things like that. Is that like her um, older cousin? Yes, <laughs> Isabel. Isabel. One of the reasons why I wanted to go on the other platform was so that I could screen share some of, uh, of Jaime's um, art because the art is crucial to his aspect of the legend. Um, he's going to tell you about it a little fact, bit more. You were, candles. all right, I was going to blow out the candles. Um, we were actually working on, we made a whole, a whole presentation for this part of it. Uh, unfortunately, he's not going to, we're not going to be able to see those pictures. We are going to post them as part of the video for this. Um, so when we post this on podcast, uh, this is one of the reasons why midnight.fm, unfortunately, is not going to be able to get this unless they get the podcast and the video part of it. Um, but this is part of the reason why we wanted to do that platform is these pictures are amazing. You saw some of the pictures, right, as you were working on it? Yes. What do you think about those? I thought they were by Van Gogh. Oh, really? So it's going to be really interesting because not only are we going to be talking about how he does the art, right, but we're also going to be talking about um, um, how he actually creates this art because it's not traditional artwork itself. So the reason for him creating it, um, but also how he does it, which is unique in and of itself. So you're an artist, right? You have kind of the way that you do things. Um, I have like a thing over there. Right, we have an entire plate. I mean, people have seen it before on, on the stuff that we've done. She has an entire bench where she does her artwork and things like that. So it's... Um, it's it's a it's a really interesting story. We're gonna wait for him before we kind of get into it too much because he is the expert in it and he's got kind of this unique perspective. But before we get to it, why don't we talk about the new book that we got today? Oh yes, the yes. Show book. the new book that we got. Um, don't turn out out the lights. So don't turn out the lights. It's like a sequel, not really a sequel. Like push it to the camera so they can kind of see it. But a kind of um like sequel-ish kind of thing to a scary story to tell in the dark. It's, it's like, like a like a tribute. It's got like the same thing. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things where uh, I think all the writers were inspired by scary things to, uh, scary, scary stories to tell in the dark, which we've done episodes on. Yes. And you and I have done episodes on it. And we had to go right out and buy it because because the editor is who? John Mayberry, we know John, John Mayberry, Mayberry, and we actually, there's another, there's a contributor in here as well, um, and I always pronounce her name wrong, so I'm going to make sure I get it right. Um, her name is, she's one of our, uh, Gabby Triana. Gabby Triana is also in here, uh, and I've been seeing her promote the stuff, and I think we should do an entire episode after we've read this book. Yes, Because this is uh, kind of what we've been talking about in terms of, People read a story, they get inspired, they rate their own story based on it. You know, so we have kind of this feeding between the, between the different legends. Make yeah. sense? Yep. Beautiful. Excellente. Um, so we're going to probably, uh, when Jaime comes in, Jaime's going to give his story. We're going to hold off on getting other calls um, because I don't have the ability to take more than one call, first of all. Um, but second of all, because I want to make sure that he has an opportunity to tell kind of his whole story. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, uh, it is actually, um, uh, my friend Jennifer is the one who brought him to my attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were kind of talking, the three of us were talking together. It's actually her birthday today. So we can maybe dedicate this show to her. What do you think? Yeah. Happy yeah, birthday, because she's Jennifer. the reason why, she's the reason why, um, uh, we're able to get this. Happy so, birthday, Jennifer. Is that Jen Stone? No, it's not Jen Stone. Oh. That's Jen Stone. <laughs> this is Jennifer. Um, I had heard this story only in passing, right? I didn't know too much about it. But I realized that the elements of it, mom kills kids. Oh, see, there she is. She's there she kid. is. Hi. Uh, mom kills kids. Right? Yeah. Um, and then, like, now there's a kind of curse. We actually have Jaime coming on right now. Um, I'm... Jaime, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Excellent, excellent. So uh, we are on right now. 
with uh, artist Jaime Gonzalez. And um, you said you wanted to start off by telling an interesting story about your name, or is that was that just a joke? No, no, that's a, that's a good way to start. Okay. You can hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Well, on my on my birth certificate, it says Jaime Gonzalez. That's my name. I spell J A I M E. So a lot of people, when they first see it, they don't say Jaime. They say Jamie. Right. Or but, and then I try to correct them and say, No, it's it's Jaime. Uh, then they'll say Jaime. And uh, the other thing about it is that I'm from El Paso, Texas. Mm-hmm. And El Paso has lots of Jaimes and lots of Gonzalez. So I grew up with a very common name that was, for some reason, hard to pronounce. Uh, so I began to use Santiago as I became uh, involved in the art scene. Um, I began to sign my name Santiago Gonzalez. Santiago is the same as Jaime. Basically, uh, Jaime means James. Santiago means Saint James. Hmm, I didn't know that. So I just, you know, yeah. Uh, so I just canonized myself, you know. And then I met another artist with the name Santiago Gonzalez. Oh my word! So I thought, well, I'm gonna go up all out. I'm using my old name, my new name, my dad's name, and my mom's name. And it, I began to go by Jaime Santiago Gonzalez Aragón. And I would use that in art and when I would go to open mic just to piss off the MC. Yes, <laughs> and then it became about ethnicity, okay? Yeah. Since I'm from Apaso, I'm from Apaso, Texas. So I was raised with an identity crisis. I have these people telling me I'm this and these people telling me I'm that. So it took me a long time to write this poem, but it's about my name. And I love to begin by asking you to ask me if I'm Hispanic. Okay. Hey, hey, Jamie, uh, or whatever. Uh, are you Hispanic? What? Hispanic, Hispanic, I'm nobody's panic. I'm Atlantic, Chicano to the bone. I take the cultures around me and I make them my own. You ask me my ethnicity, it depends who is asking me. I'm a Mexican to my mother, I'm Chicano to my brother, I'm American to the INS. I am Latino to my lover, I am king of the border, I am your brother. I am Jaime Santiago Gonzalez Aragón de Chuco y Que. Nice to meet you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> very Thank cool. You. Very cool. Um, so I am here. I'm here. I'm not sure if you have it up. I'm here with my daughter. Uh, my daughter and I are doing it. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted her here was because this is a really popular legend with younger kids um, and with teenagers and tweens and things like that. And as I was going over elements of it, uh, and really as you were telling me them, because I know nothing about it, I know very little about it, um, you were, I, I was shocked because I'm like, I've come across this story a dozen times uh, in tripping on legends and, and pre-tripping on legends in terms of um, elements of the story. So can you give us like the authentic, uh, uh, unedited version of the story? Before you get into your relationship with it, just tell us what the actual legend is all about. Well, okay, I mean, um... It, it belongs to Mexico. We're talking about the legend of La Llorona, of course. It's a Mexican legend that goes as far back as 300 years. It's been told in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, basically it's about women who get betrayed by her man and her revenge is she kills the kid in the river and then haunts, haunts forever searching for them. Mm -hmm. Now you might see some 
similarities in other cultures, other stories. Right. Like, for example, the, the Greeks have the Medea and, and, the, and, the, and the Lamia, uh, which are very similar. Uh, in mythology, I love the Lamia. She gets cursed by Hera because she has an affair with Zeus. Mm-hmm. And, her curse is, and her curse is to eat her own children. But her appetite keeps growing, so she starts eating other people's children. My word. And is is that the story? Is that the story where then Zeus takes one and puts it in its leg, and that becomes? Or no no no. Was it Persephone it's, it's that it becomes? Gods. Yeah. No, Persephone. Persephone's Demeter's son. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. I don't care about mythology too. <laughs> yeah, she's gonna correct me on that stuff. As, as, as like Mexican mythology, right. only this, in this case, it's real. It's true. There are people that swear by it, mm-hmm. and I am one because I was a witness. I don't know if it was my imagination or not, but I did see her, and. Um, it's been told over and over and over again, and it's been used as a cautionary tale. Um, I love to begin by saying caution. This is a cautionary tale. Right. A tale of a tale of love, of murder, of betrayal. Parental guidance is suggested. <laughs> That's fine. My daughter's a mature eleven, so. Unless you're a uh, Chicano like me, because if you have a Mexican mother, you probably heard the story when you were about three. Okay. Now, in my case, it was my sisters. I have five sisters, and yes, I was a spoiled brat. They all took care of me except for the one who, you know, challenged me <laughs> and picked on me and tried to scare me every chance to get. Every noise we would hear outside, did you hear that? That's La Llorona. Just to remind me to behave, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, it's been tied to all kinds of things like uh, postpartum depression and, you know, the whole plight of the mm-hmm. female. Right. So I if, I can, if I can interrupt really quickly. So there's a um, – in Smith College, I was just talking about this uh, on Sam Balchus' show – there's a, a legend at Smith College in uh, in Massachusetts where it's the same kind of thing where if she kills her kids, she comes back to haunt this dorm, and mm-hmm. you have to find her on Halloween as a freshman or else she's going to spend the rest of your four years stalking you down. So my question to you is, um, what is the caution? Like, who are we? Are we... Are we supposed to get it from the um, the woman? Like, is the moral of the story to not mess around on your husband? Um, is the moral of the story uh, be careful of your kids? Like, what exactly are we supposed to learn from the actual story? Other than other than don't okay. listen to no, your no, sisters. No, no, that's a good yeah, <laughs> I guess the real moral of the story is sisters are always torturing you. I know that myself. I know that so. myself. Yeah. Uh, in, in South America exists uh, another version of her. Um, oh, God, I can't think of the name of it right now, but she's the same. She's a woman who goes out in the night, but she poses as a beautiful prostitute. Mm-hmm. And if, if you're a married man and if you approach her, she turns around and devours you with her horse head. Oh, my word. <laughs> so... So with that one, it's pretty clear, but in the case of La Llorona, I think it's all tied into the betrayal, you know? Right. Uh, um, uh, the betrayal of the husband to her, and then the betrayal of God from her. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, because she gets cursed by God. Okay. Forever, because there's her kid in, in the limbo. She's not in heaven, she's not in hell, she's a ghost. Right, and that's because, and that's because of God and because of her betrayal when she killed the kid. Do people blame, like, do women themselves um, in Mexico blame a crime that they've done on her? 
like that they were possessed by her when they killed one of their children or when other things happened? Do they say, oh, 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 La Lorana made me do it? She's, she's going to grimace uh, every time I say it. No, not really. It's not like that. No. Uh, she, it's more that they see her mm-hmm. or they hear her. Okay. Uh, she's not known to possess anybody. Although I did see a movie about her where she does do that. There has been a, a handful of low-budget movies about her. And the big one that appeared... Uh, a couple of years ago, I was kind of disappointed in the Hollywood version because it didn't spend enough time on the original story about how it happened. Right. You know, if it's, it's, it's focused on now and tried to, you know, I mean, yeah, it went for those cheap scares, but um, for me, it was more a psychological scare. You know, because you you're afraid of a woman who's crying so it's kind of a mind screw you know cause right like you sympathize for her but you're afraid for her because you don't know what she's gonna do to you and what my sister used to tell me was that she was looking for new children that she still hurts and if she doesn't like you she'll kill you too so it's one of those things where it's like you do what you're supposed to do, or she's going to come and get you. Exactly. You come home early, or La Llorona is going to get you. Uh, she was kind of like the boogeyman, mm-hmm. but um, like I said, a lot of people think that too. They think that they've seen her. There's been numerous sightings. Um, I was a part of a group who did uh, investigations paranormal investigation. The group was the uh, Southwest Paranormal Society, which was like a brother group to the ghost adventurers. Mm-hmm. He did the ghost tours and investigations, and a couple of people um, in the group were very interested in the legend of La Llorona, and we began to do a documentary about her, even where we would go out to the river at night to look for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there any particular but, uh, place where she is? Or is it just she can be anywhere where where kids are being bad or men are being unfaithful? She's always connected to the water. She's always close okay. to the water. And, that's really and if you're Mexican, she'll find you no matter where you are. <laughs> right, right. Um... Let me, let me ask you just really quickly, because you mentioned the Conjuring Universe movie, and I know there are other um, Central uh, uh, and, and Mexican movies made of it. Is this kind of one of those things where, um, and I tackle this kind of stuff all the time, so I feel free, pretty easy being able to do it, and there's been an episode of Supernatural, there's been an episode of Grimm, which I didn't know about, thank you. Um, is it offensive for a Mexican to see... Um, that legend uh, being uh, made by an American film company and like maybe like you said getting it wrong is there like in a like a yeah. general sense of or is it like oh wow that's cool I know that one you know well that, that, that's mixed yeah that's a tough one because I was really excited when I found out it was coming out but I, I kept my expectations low right 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 but um, uh, it, I was kind of offended on a lower level. Mm-hmm. I mean, the day, you know, it was, it was a nice try. I'm like, I'm working on a, I'm working on the script right now for the prequel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was accepted, but right, right. I do have, no, I'm, and that, that's only half a joke because I have paintings about her. I have poetry about her. And I have a, a long short story. And in my version, uh, it involves a little m- more about the man. Okay. About the man who betrayed her and who did that to her. Because in the legend, I mean, he's, you know, he's like, okay, fine, he's gone. Right. And 
my sister did it like that. You know? Right. <laughs> and he, he is totally out of the story and out of the legend. But in my version, uh, he, he comes back. He's, he's in there and he gets his... But but in the traditional story, he's just left like he commits the sin, and she's the one that suffers, right? Right, right. So right. this is exactly. this is this is another example of uh, of women being tortured and women suffering the bad stuff in the in the legend, and the man really kind of getting away with it, unless you know you want to conclude like, oh well, you know he lost his children, blah blah blah. But she's the one who's tortured for eternity while he yeah. is. You're right. He's pretty much, yeah. you know, gets off scot-free, as they say. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. exactly right. Is, um, you know, and we, we, we've talked about, like, different um, different ones, you know, like Native Americans, for example. Uh, we are stealing their legends uh, all the time. Or uh, what we've a lot of what we've covered on Tripping on Legends is, for example, they take a story... And they, they, it's an American story, it's a European story, but they put Native Americans as the characters because it makes it feel mystical. And it makes it feel like, oh my God. you know what I'm saying? Like more, you're like, ooh, yeah. you no, know, this was a Native American. It makes it seem like it's I spookier. <laughs> right, and so I that's why I was asking you. Trying to do it themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, 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 let me ask you about your relationship with her. Because that's really an interesting thing. You said you saw her. I would love to hear the story about when you saw her. Ellie, you can ask any questions, too, by the way, you want. Okay. Okay. I would love to hear the story about when you saw her and the, the repercussions of that, because it's really an amazing story. Okay. Well, um, uh, I'll tell you when I saw her, and then I'll go into the story. Okay. Okay. I was about six. Um, I was visiting my grandparents in Juarez, Mexico, which is five minutes away from El Paso. You would just hop over the border and over the river, and there you are. And it was close to the river, and it was really um, a hot night, and all the windows were open. And I was in my room with a few of my sisters, but everybody was asleep except me. Mm-hmm. And I heard something outside the window. It sounded like crying. I took a peek and I saw like a floaty white thing along the water. And my blood ran cold. I closed my eyes and then I heard a knock on the door. And I woke up my sister. Mm-hmm. They went to the door to open it, and I told them, No, don't, it's La Llorona. And they said, Tessa. And no, wait, so one second. So wait, they spent your whole life torturing you about it, and then when you say you were actually seeing it, they were they were saying you, you, that's not true. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that's why I hate sisters. <laughs> yep, that's why sisters are horrible. <laughs> older sisters. Okay, good, older sisters, was, fine. <laughs> And when they opened the door, of course, there was nothing there. But I would have bad dreams about it. And they would keep, you know, putting it in my head that she's going to get me. And, so, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, continue. So, um, I, you know, eventually grew up and became a folk artist that was obsessed with her story. So I did a lot of research, and um, I have a whole series of paintings that I have uh, displayed at a few museums and galleries all over town Mm -hmm. and uh, a few places in New Mexico. I have even had a whole festival in her name. Two or three times I had a Ayorona festival and uh, turned it into a whole evening of poetry and art and food and music and movies. And it got pretty, it got pretty cool. And um, so I have this thing where if I do have it up, I'll go and I hang out along the paintings 
And um, if somebody asks about them, I'll tell them, well, you know, it's the legend. Right. The superstition passed down in the oral tradition so that men and children be warned. I'll have more fairy than a woman scorned. Definitely not. <laughs> and, okay. and what is your... Um, other than an amazement for the story, because this is the part that, that really drew me in. Why do you create art that is about her? Like, what purpose does it serve? Well, I'll get to that at the end of this poem. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> to the Aztecs, she was an omen of the coming conquest. Then she's conveyed to La Malinche, who was betrayed by Cortez. We'll come back to that. To me, she was just a woman in a white dress with hair black as coal, but not as black as her nights alone, even though she was the most beautiful woman in Mexico. <laughs> when she sees the world in color now and thanks her stars above for sending her a blue-eyed man, for whom she falls in love. So she stretches out her sort of white dress with her big round belly and her swollen breast. He comes and goes from time to time. She stays home and multiplies. Then he tells the truth to her one day, how he loves the kids but cannot stay. He must go back to his old life in his old house with his old wife. Her heart grew cold and black on that day, and with that, she was betrayed. So she takes the kids he loves so dear and brings them to a river near. Under the water, she holds their heads. In the full moonlight, she gets revenge. And then she takes her own life as well and ends up at the gates of hell. And even the devil rejects her there. So her sanity returns to fill her with remorse as she begs forgiveness from the Lord, who appears at St. Michael with his sword and curses her to roam the rios and the barrios forever, searching for her lost children and crying out, her famous cry. I behold. La Llorona, she lives in Juarez. Every day it's in the news. She fills the river with her tears and every night she sings the blues. She is not to be accused this time. There's no blood on her hands. She's happy at home in Juaritos, sometimes known as murder land. Chuchuco Ponte Trucha, though protected by our icon, Mount Cristo Rey has bullet holes, so now he has some guns. The Virgen de Guadalupe is not about to give in. She's become a superhero, Wonder Virgin. And together with a child on the bottom row, they form what I call a Chicano protocol. A child in the arms of La Llorona, in the arms of the Virgin, under the full moon. I am the child. I saw her when I was six in my room. She was at my window. She was at my door. She was in my nightmares almost every night. Until I began to paint and write about her and for her. And then the nightmares ended. Art therapy. So I made a deal with her, you see. I continue to tell her story, and she lets me sleep. So thank you all for giving me another night's peace. That's amazing. Wow. Good. The can scene, right? <laughs> um, I, and that really weaves all of this other stuff in it. I, I remember um, there was an old episode. If fans of the show know, 
that I'm a huge, um, uh, my favorite Twilight Zone is the 80s Twilight Zone. And I remember there was an episode, it might have been Ray Bradbury. So if it was Ray Bradbury, don't be offended. But it was that same kind of thing. It was a writer who had writer's block and he was being tormented by these little things, which are almost like, you know, like puck wedgies or these little troll type things. And, oh, yeah. and it wasn't until he started writing about them that they went away. Right. And they were like, we were, we're tormenting you because we want our story told. And as he started to type about them, they went away one by one by one. Is that a true story, Jaime? It did. Did she torment you until you started to create art about her, or is that an artistic? No, that that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Uh, especially when I was young, you know. I mean, I was like, I would have nightmares. I was terrified. And mm. even as I grew a little bit older, she was. I was always. I still had that fear, you know. Yeah. But then, like in my like in my early teens, when I became adventurous and began to like things like that. I got a little more into it and began to do a lot of research. And I've conducted interviews and, I mean, I've had exhibits where I've had people tell their encounters, you know? It's, uh, it, it became a pretty important thing. And I've been, I've been at it for about 15 years mm -hmm. as, a, as a professional artist. I got a job at a museum here. I was super lucky. I, I, I got a job just as a, as a security guard, and then I became a docent. And I never considered myself a professional artist. You know, it was just a, like a hobby for me. But I, I, was a, I was a poet first. I just began to kind of illustrate my poetry onto anything I can find. I paint on old pieces of wood. In fact, a big part of the series of La Llorona is on old windows. Old windows. I call them the windows of my soul. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. the windows of my soul. <laughs> um, which has been a challenge because I've broken a few of them, but then I just replace the glass and paint over it. And that is not only how you experienced her, for the first time, but also how your sisters would torment you. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of appropriate that you're painting them on windows, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the first time I saw her was through a window. Right. Um, so it's grown from, it's become, it went from a fear to a curiosity to kind of an empathy and, uh, that's about how it is, yeah. Ex explain what you mean by empathy. Like, who, are you empathizing well, with her? Are you empathizing with... Ella's yeah, busting out, her. I think. <laughs> Ella, hold on, let's say it. Ella's too tired, man. She's dropping out. We just started school this week, so say goodbye, Ella. Okay. Bye -bye. All right, Ella's out. <laughs> yeah, don't give Ella bad teams. All right, now that we're alone, let's talk about some dirty stuff. No, just kidding. Um, tell me, tell me about, yeah, who are you empathizing with in this story? Yeah, it would be with her. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, uh, just like how we talked about how it's sort of the themes of the whole story is the subjugation of women. And, right. Um, and, uh, so I was raised by, I was raised by women, so I, 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 I not only respect them, I fear them. <laughs> right. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but I can sympathize, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just become, and she's such a part of the culture of Mexico, you know. Uh, it's it's just it's like a part of the history almost. Now, what and, are the kids ever empathized with? I mean, are the like? I guess my focus, uh, and Ella would just left, but still, um, that idea of. What is the what is the focus on the kids in the story? But then also, how do uh, Mexican tweens and Mexican teens and Mexican little kids even uh, are they still reacting to the story? Is it is it is it still being told? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's the part of the whole story that is so crystal, you know. 
I mean, you really do sympathize with these kids because they really had nothing to do with it. And right. They got they, they were murdered, so it helps in the whole the the aspect of being a cautionary tale to frighten kids into being and into behaving uh, because. It's just such a grisly thing to do to a child. Yeah, it really is. It's the whole part of the story that that's what that's the twist that it makes it so 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 horrible and grisly. That's what was so terrifying to me as a kid was that anyway, that doesn't make sense. The kids didn't do anything. Right. And so that that's why it's such a such a, a horrible story. And and it's but, it's uh, interesting because. And I, and I think here's where um, maybe that little bit of hidden, uh, that the legend gets hidden within other legends and the connection isn't made to American stories that might be borrowing from it, is that, like you were saying earlier, postpartum depression is a real thing. Um, there yeah. seem to be a string um, in Texas, right? Uh, and other places where yeah. women were killing their children. Like I said, we mentioned the... Uh, I mentioned the story uh, of um, of Smith College, but I mean, we also have in the Lizzie Borden house, uh, the first murders that took place there were the same kind of thing. And I think uh, Americanized, we have rationalized it, right? We've rationalized it as, well, this is what happened. It was probably postpartum depression where we might actually just be having um, paranormal experience and we're borrowing uh, that Mexican folktale, that Mexican horror story, and putting it on it without even realizing that we're doing it because it now, especially, you said 300 years, like 300 years later, yeah. that story has become as famous without necessarily the name attached to it as, you know, the 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 wandering woman in white or the the suicide couple or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's been it's been analyzed. <laughs> Stables and all of that, mm -hmm. but um, it it you know it is what it is, and it's it's so old. Uh, the Aztecs were the first ones to talk about her, and it was just prior to the conquest. Mm -hmm. The Aztecs would see a woman in white, white gown, with black hair, along the water, crying. I mis hijos, oh my children. Oh, my children. But in that case, she was crying for all of Mexico that was about to get conquered. So you have, she becomes symbolic of uh, the bad stuff that's going on with all the social things, and it just kind of takes the persona of this woman. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, and, it, and then it, it changes according to the times. Like when the Aztecs saw her, they thought she resembled one of the daughters of Montezuma. Really? And yes. Uh, Seth warned them about Cortez, and and then it gets conquered, right? And um, she's compared to La Malinche, who was uh, a, a wife of Cortez, and she gets upset with him because he uh, tries to sell her to his brother mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, so her revenge on him is she kills her son. Oh, wow. That she had with him. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, so she's compared to her a lot. But, like, in these days, uh, like, in, in my childhood, she was a Mexican, a peasant, along the river, who fell in love with a white guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've, you've got that, so whatever you need for the time, it, changes, it slides in. Yeah, it changes with the time, but it's the same basic story. Let, let me ask you a question, because we're... We're running a little low on time, but I want to I want to ask you this question. Um, do you feel that you 
um, and your sisters created the woman that you saw? Do you think that they used it so many times to freak you out that they created her? Or do you think that they're, she is like the one and only one? Well, that's, that's a 50-50. <laughs> Non-committal, love it. Because, like I said, I was six years old. You know, the imagination of a six-year-old, right? Especially after you put all those things in his little hair. Right. Uh, but but you can't go back now, Jaime. You said that you thought it was real, so you can't say now it was just your imagination. I'm not saying. I'm saying it could have been my imagination. Oh, okay, okay. But as I grew up and I researched it, I, I fleshed her out. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm certain that I saw her. Yeah, because that's, right. that's like... Like a huge part of my life right now. In my town, I'm known as a Jose Sala Yorona guy. Hey, that's better than the Puck Wudgie guy. That's what I was known as for a while. So <laughs> the what? Okay, we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk off air about that. We don't have time to get into the Puck Wudgie stuff. <laughs> okay. But it but it is this kind okay. of it is this kind of interesting thing because it's so ingrained in Mexican culture, and she's she can't be appearing all these different places at once. So is it one of those things where she's so like a, a boogeyman that little kids create her, you know what I'm saying? Or even parents create her or a community creates their own version of it and it becomes a living, breathing, walking thing. You know, we've talked about thought forms and things like yeah. that before. Well, I would say it's possible, but, it, it, you know, it, 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 began, it, it began somewhere. And all all of those things are rooted in in truth, right? And it's got all these branches that it's become, you know. And she's not the only one, especially in the Mexican culture. Um, like, have you heard of um, Alechuza? No. Nope. Have you heard? No. Nope. Go ahead. She's a shape. She, she's a shape shifting witch with the body of a bird. She sold her soul to the devil for dark magic powers of the unknown, and upon her was bestowed the duty of collecting souls. La Lechuza makes herself sound like the sad song of a bird or like a baby's cry. If you think you hear La Lechuza, it is a good, because somebody just might die. Only two things are known to bring La Lechuza to a halt. She is not a fan of swearing, and she's not a fan of salt. So if you ever find yourself in the presence of La Lechuza one night, and you don't have any salt, you better get ready to run for your life as you curse that freaking witch out. <laughs> I didn't know if I could go. I don't know if I could cuss her up. <laughs> no, no, no. Why don't we not? Although we, we, we did exactly, Della, I was about to say that. We did lose the, uh, the midnight.fm feed for some reason. Uh, the internet's been all wacky tonight because of the storms. But there is um, a very similar legend uh, to that. Della's stealing my, uh, my thunder in the, in the chat room um, of the Stikini. Um, and the Stikini were seminal witches who once again gave up their uh, humanity to have these magical abilities and they were, they could transform themselves into owls. Wow, yeah. And That's they did cool. the same thing. And, and yeah. as a matter of fact, I know that the story also goes into Texas because there are some references into Texas and obviously Oklahoma as the Seminoles go into Oklahoma, but it has all those same elements. We're borrowing from each other back and forth. Yeah, that's funny. It's all related. It's all like, it's all uh, has a lot of common. That's, that's exactly, true. exactly. I'm going to have to send you this, my Stikini article so you can see it. So you can see, oh my word, like, and, and the weird thing about yeah, them is that um, they are uh, more together. They're actually, they actually are in a pack. So uh, were yours in a pack or is it, is it a single woman that you have to swear at? It's just, it's just, a, it's just a single woman. Okay. I've sworn at many single women myself in my day. Um, <laughs> where can people get in contact with you or see your artwork or um, um, oh my God. read some of your poetry? 
Oh, geez, I, I'm kind of in seclusion right now, but I'm on Facebook. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Well, uh, well, you know, I'm going to push some of your artwork for this stuff, and, uh, and it's going to, if you're listening to this on podcast, you are going to have to go to uh, the Facebook page, and I'm actually going to make a whole section of the Tripping on Legends Facebook dedicated to this, because as he was saying that poem, each element of that poem has a picture attached to it. Um, and I love the picture of her with, you know, you said Wonder Virgin. It's, a, you know, a picture of a, someone who looks a lot like Wonder Woman and they're together. And, and um, I, <laughs> I, I really actually yeah. love that picture because it's both simple <laughs> and very complex at the same time. Um, but they... My mom doesn't like that one. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some, there's some really good artwork. And so um, I would suggest that people... Uh, go to the Facebook page at facebook.com uh, backslash Tripping on Legends where we're going to have all of that artwork. He's allowed us to put it up there. And you can kind of listen to this uh, on your podcast or just listen to watch the video in the background and look at some of these pictures. And they almost come alive. Like you, it, And one of the interesting things about your artwork is I think you the empathy, but also the, 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 the being scared of but also empathizing with her really comes through in your artwork, like both in the colors and the way she, her back always seems to be turned. Um, you get this very sad and yet really creepy impression of her. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. And I'm not, I'm not artistically trained or anything. It's, it's very crude. Um, I refer to myself as a mystical realist. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you know what? It, it's it's got that folk art feel to it, where it doesn't have to be like you know. Fit. I mean, it's got the the feeling of right. like you're saying, like you're right, you're you're painting on the materials that are inspiring you and things like that. Um, so that's going to be a project, yeah, just getting all that stuff up so people can hear these. Um, and maybe we'll maybe we can even make a slideshow with just you saying the poem and some of those uh, rolling around too, because they really the story yeah. is about the art and the art is about the story. So. Um, we're going to let you go. Uh, Thank you very much for coming on. Me. No problem. All I've right. got a quick one more for you. Oh, Can go I give ahead. You one more? You take your time. Okay. We're already, we've already been booted off okay. one network, so you take your time on this. Go <laughs> ahead, brother. Well, it's real quick because we're talking about the witches and well, it's who's that. Another one that I, was, that I did a painting on is of Frau Perchka. Uh, Frau Pritzka is like the female Krampus. You've heard of Krampus, right? Yep. Well, she's like the female Krampus. Uh, and I wrote a little poem about her, and it goes like this. Frau Pritzka, Frau Pritzka of Bavaria. She's a shape-shifting witch that visits on Christmas. If you're good, you get a shiny silver coin. If you're bad, she splits you open and replaces your guts with pebbles and straw and garbage. Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful night. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be in touch. All right. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Halloween. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Bye. That was Jaime Gonzalez. Um, and if you've actually listened to our Christmas episode, um, the first year uh, where we did it leading into Christmas, we talked about different Christmas legends, and that was, once again, a common theme was ripping the people open and replacing them with um, other things. It was really kind of cool. Like, that's actually, uh, there's a Mexican legend about that, too. Maybe we're going to have, maybe we should do Christmas stories with Jaime uh, uh, this Christmas. Maybe that might be a really cool, uh, interesting little thing. Maybe we can get a whole bunch of, of folklorists to actually come on uh, on Christmas Eve and just tell their five-minute story. That sounds like something I should plan because um, that would make for an amazing show. And this has been an amazing show. I can't believe the hour just flew by. Um, I, we lost Ella. We lost Midnight.fm. But those are both places that you can... Uh, uh, that those are both parts of the show, so you can listen to us on midnight.fm. And I would suggest going on there. You can listen to Tim Weisberg's show, you can listen to Amy Martin's show. Um, uh, Into the Fray is now on there. Uh, New England Legends is going to start uh, posting some of their stories to it. So it really is this kind of growing network 
where you can just kind of put it on and listen to the paranormal all day. And then, of course, on Tuesdays at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, the only time to zone that matters, you can hear me. Uh, and if you're not doing it already, you really should be following us on Facebook, which is facebook.com backslash tripping on legends. Uh, we also have Haunted uh, Florida, uh, Haunted Florida Love Stories. So it's backslash Haunted Florida Love Stories. You can get all the information about what we're doing, the Ocala book, uh, as well as seeing some of Jaime's work as well. I'm going to put it up on the um, website as well, which is trippingonlegends.com. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Spooky Balzano. And you can follow me on Instagram at Spooky Tripping. So for me, for Ella, who has disappeared, uh, for Mr. Gonzalez, who is gracious enough to come on and be our first live guest, which was pretty cool. Uh, I am Christopher Balzano. Balzano. You'd hear it from the bedroom. And here's hoping that all your trips are legendary. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Oh, wait, Ella's going to come on for one last thing. Bye-bye. <laughs> all right, that's good. Keep moving. Keep it moving. <laughs>